You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 2, page 47. We're your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. And over there in the corner is uh, ro 8 Oh, yeah. Today's story is Uberman by John Madai. John Madai is from Dallas, Texas, and is currently working on a short story collection called Hideous Tales of Doomed Spacemen, Demonic Cameras, Protoplasmic Flesh Eaters, The Supernatural, UFOs, Interdimensional Beasts, Evil Children, Misunderstood Robots, Telephone Calls from the Beyond the Grave, May, Murder, and the Macabre. <sighs> Uberman by John Madai. March 14, 1946, Nuremberg. Eugene Cresswell, psychiatrist, captain, U.S. Army, interviews Friedrich Stromner, commonly known as Uberman, Oberkommando of Nazi Germany. Uberman lies in his cell encased in a two-foot-thick chromium steel cocoon designed by the Army Corps of Engineers, employing five goldsnick locking mechanisms which completely restrict any movement of the head or limbs. The entire device resembles a deep-sea diver's pressure suit crossed with an Iron Maiden. The only segment of unexposed flesh is visible through a small, grated hatch in the faceplate, through which one can see Uberman's pale blue eyes in his lineless face. A narrow mouth and patrician nose, and a single, pure yellow spit curl of hair on his forehead. He wears a monocle, but this is only an affectation. Uberman is one of twenty defendants awaiting trial for war crimes, crimes against peace, and crimes against humanity. Uberman is twenty-five years old, born February 1, 1921 in Stahlstadt, Silesia. His father was an uneducated barley farmer. Uberman graduated from gymnasium in 1940, but did not attend university. He worked as a machine press operator at Mengelwerk's ball bearing plant until 1941, when he volunteered for the Afrika Corps and served as a private in the German 5th Light Division. How did you like Africa, Uberman? A disgusting place. It was sand and fleas and starved dogs. The people were barbarians. What was your job? Artillery. I drove a lorry with cargoes of shells. And when did that end? In Tobruk. There was a siege by the English, and there were five of us, my friends and I, in a... You have a word. Hat box with machine guns. You know this thing? A pillbox? A pillbox, yes. A box with pills. And an English tank, smaller than a panzer, less well-crafted. It rolled over us. Were you frightened? Of course I would be. The men about me were screaming, their arms became dislodged, and I was covered with their organs. Then the treads of the tank were over me, and the concrete coming down, hitting my face. What happened then? I feel a tremendous um, starker in me. The bones of my head, all about the skin and flesh. I was with exceptional strength. I lifted the tank over me. I was surprised that I could do this thing. And then what? It is at this time that I peeled the tank open, like a can of meat. I killed those inside. I shook them. Were you feeling anger? Anger, yes. And fright. I thought I was becoming near to death. The Anglanders fired their weapons and a grenade discharged by my head. I thought I would die or my skin would be taken off in a painful way, but the munitions deflected from me. I was not expelled or penetrated. I screamed and threw the tank as if a football. This is the method in which I first learned that I was a parahuman. 
Before this incident, had you ever had any indications that you had parahuman powers? None at all. I had done farm work as a boy, so was strong, but had always been sickly. I had measles three times. It almost killed me when I was 10. I also suffered pleurisy, fits, and one time liver poisoning. How did your commandant react when you lifted the tank? Oh, the officers went mad. I was kept under armed guard for three days with a bag on my head. The Gestapo came and airlifted me to Schloss Rufen in Prussia. I stayed for three months, and they performed tests on me. What kind of tests? At the start, they were mentalist tests that I did not understand. They shine colored lights in my eyes for hours, ask riddles of me, ask me to hold objects, once a candlestick, once a dried vine, once a picture of a human hand, and ask me from where they came. Asked me to disassemble a rifle with my brain, which of course I could not. Then they tested my durableness. Is this the word? Uh, durability? Yes, this, at which I performed much more satisfactory. They put me in a freezing chamber and find I could survive and still function at absolute zero. And then they put me in an oven and see that I can be heated to plasmic temperatures without damage. I survive in a vacuum, in pressures to 30,000 kilos, in baths of sulfuric acid. I survive all poisons and nerve agents. I spend a morning in Zyklon B, evening in mustard gas. I survive on a diet of dirt and weeds, or nothing at all. I survive small arms fire, heavy artillery, jelly gasoline, nitroglycerin, with no disruption. I am impervious. None of the test group lived for more than seconds, except for the starving tests. What do you mean? Uh, all the tests had many test subjects to see human tolerances. You mean there were other people with you in the freezers and ovens? In the explosives? Yeah. Who were they? I don't know. Not parahumans. I would think they were Poles or gypsies. We did not speak, except the starving ones who only raved. It was most tiresome. They swallowed their tongues. But why did the scientists do that? They already knew an ordinary human can't survive poison and bombs. What's the point of them? Why was that necessary? This is scientific method. An experiment is not verifiable unless it is repeatable. How did you feel about this? What about? About men being incinerated with you. Did you watch them choke? Did they burst? Did they vomit? Did they fight? How did, how did you feel? I am impervious. Oh. When they discovered I could fly, they sent me to the Luftwaffe. This is when you fought in France? Yes. And over England with the RAF and the Americans. These were the beautiful days. Nights in the atmosphere, walking with jackboots on the wings of bombers, and see the ground shake below with bombings, a, a garden of orange mushrooms lighting in the dark. It was a happy year and full of victory, dashing fighters from the sky. If I could return to a time, it would be this time. This is when you fought the U.S. parahuman, Captain Spitfire? Yes. It was a great battle, and he was a fine ace, your great countryman. It lasted many hours until dawn. We, with our hands on each other's throats over the channel, we were closely matched, and many times I thought that he would best me. But at last I overpowered him. I broke his back and put him into the ocean. It was a noble struggle. Did you go back to Germany often? With frequency. I was there, a hero. The best hotels, luxuries I had not known. Wines of great price, the best cabarets, and so many medals, so many they could not fit on my person. Iron crosses, Condor Legion, Danzig Cross, Eagle Order, many parades and ceremonies of honor. I am, did you know, a high Aryan knight and holy son of Wotan. No, I didn't know that. Let me ask you about the women. There, there were many women, many multiplications more than as the average man. It would take lifetimes for men to have this many women. Actresses, widows, not widows, maidens, hundreds, all beautiful, all pure. Did you have any children? Eighteen to my knowledge. But these are only the legitimate children, the ones made for breeding in the Joy Division. The object was to breed a race of parahumans? This was the objective. A generation of Ubermen and their mates. Did any of your children show any signs of parahumanity? No, not that I was told in my last dispatch. 
but they are all below five years of age, and I did not manifest my superiority until far after pubescence. Where are they now? I do not know. You would know this better than I. Do you truly not know? They have escaped, I hope. You will know them when they are grown. Boy and girl gods flying to you from a savage jungle, nine. They will be displeased with you, I think. Do you truly not know where they are? I can't... Uh, do you have Ferdinand? He was the oldest, a fine boy. Are you in possession of him? Did you know any high-ranking members of the Reich? You cannot tell me of the children. I'm afraid that's classified. I really... You do not have them. I see this now. You are worried. Thank you, Doctor. Did you know... I suppose I met most or all of the high command at one point or another. Goebbels, Himmler, Ribbentrop, all of the bureaucrats. But I knew none of them personally, being only a simple soldier. And Hitler? I met the Fuhrer only once. I attended a dinner at Berghof. We had roast duck, blutwurst, and turtle. Eva Braun was there, and the Japanese ambassador, and Albert Sphere. I wore my ceremonial SS uniform, the one they made for me with a black silk cape, spiked epaulets, and a silver swastika, a half meter wide on my chest. The Führer spoke throughout the meal. He was an inspired speaker, and he knew everything. Makes of rifles, Dostoevsky, the moons of Jupiter. There was nothing his knowledge did not encompass. And he had a light in the eyes, yes. A lantern behind them. It was a Klieg light in the head. Did you know he could memorize a number to 100 digits? I cannot do that. Afterwards, I was given a private audience on the balcony with him for a few minutes. We had a cognac, and he was very pleasant and cordial. What did you speak about? Breeds of mastiffs. Then he turned from me and told his aide, take the monster away now. Were you familiar with other Nazi bear humans as well? I knew them. Did you know them well, socially? To an extent. Dr. Totenkopf was the only one whom I counted as a friend, a compatriot. But I knew them all, the Han, Valkyrie, Herr Howitzer, Thor. What did you think of them? Uh, Valkyrie was very unpleasant. An officious bitch. And her power, using rontogen light to vaporize men, it was ghastly. That is not true soldiering. And she looked like a clown with her milkmaid braids and a Viking helmet with horns. A fat swine with thick ankles. I despised her. I was glad when I heard she'd been killed by the Soviet parahuman. Comrade Kremlin, bested by a Russian. A disgrace. And the others? They were passable, I think. Herr Howitzer was a mechanical man and therefore subhuman, of course. But he served Germany well and was a monument to the Reich's technology. And lucky for him, had no soul, and so cannot stand trial. Otherwise, he would be in here with us, no? We reprogrammed him. He volunteered for it. He's now fighting for us in Indochina. A fortunate Schweinhund. You served with Dr. Totenkopf towards the end of the war, didn't you? On the Russian front? This is correct. We were together in Stalingrad. These were the bad days. It was a long and bitter campaign. The Russians lived like cockroaches in bombed buildings. Terrible Bolshevik robots walked the streets. Totenkopf and I spent days, sometimes weeks, with no rest. And still we could not destroy them all. Nothing to eat but cold fish. Days of ugliness. We suffered together, he and I. We were brothers in suffering. Stalingrad was hell. What was your job in Russia? The same as it was elsewhere, to kill the enemy. How did you kill the enemy? Many ways. I fly into a building and it collapses. I crumple a tank and the men in it are crushed. I threw an entire street onto the Red Army barracks one night. Did you ever use a gun? No, I did not necessitate one. They say that when the invasion was going badly and the Reich forces were running out of ammunition, you and Dr. Totenkopf executed all the prisoners yourself to save the bullets? True. And you did this personally? True. By hand? What else? Yes, with hands. Did you... Some I crushed. I smothered them. I removed their heads. I broke necks. I am very quick. It was all without pain. It was quite very humane, you see. Much worse would have been the guns. They lived like beasts. Did you execute women? They were communists. In Stalingrad, the women fought with the men. 
I executed the women, yes. And children? Sometimes. How many people did you execute in the Soviet Union, Uberman? There is no way to say this. I, I do not know numbers. More than a million? <laughs> of course not. This is a ridiculous figure. Half a million. You are saying lies. These are not rational numbers. How many then? What is a rational number? I cannot calculate. Less than half a million? Yes, less. How much less? 200,000. 200,000 less than half a million? 300,000? No, but you are saying it without logic. 200,000 in all I killed. You killed 200,000 people with your bare hands? Yes, this number is within reason, but not exact. I, and sometimes I use the metal beam. Did you and Totenkopf bury them as well? This question is strange. Did you? Did you dig the graves? No, there were tractors for that, and privates had that duty. Usually they were burned. How do you feel about having executed 200,000 people? Weary. I have heard that Totenkopf committed suicide in his cell yesterday. That is true. They have not told me how he was able to do so. C can you tell me how he accomplished this? I'm afraid not. I thought not. I should be very interested to know. Dr. Totenkopf was as I am, you see. I was not entirely certain he could die. Does Totenkopf's suicide disturb you? Not at all, but the mechanism of his death would fascinate me. I am considering the problem of how I am going to be executed. It will be a problem. Towards the end, there were rumors of creating a bomb powered by nuclear fission. I would think your scientists are working on such a thing now. Perhaps this bomb could kill me. That might be a great thing. I would be the first man executed by molecular physics. My gallows would be the same device that burns stars. It would make a great light, a god light that would finally, maybe, incinerate me when nothing else could. It might destroy the earth. What are you writing? What? I see what you are writing. I can see through your book. I can see through you and your bones and through this wall and all the way to Paris. And I read English quite well, even backwards. You wrote Delusions of Grandeur. But aren't they? These fantasies about being executed by atomic power? Yes, Doctor. They are grand, but they are not delusions. I am Uberman. I am nothing if not proof of the master race. Everything about me is, by my nature, grand. I say this with no false pride. It is what I am. My fingernails are grand. My eyelashes are grand. Why wouldn't the method of my obliteration be grand? I have no delusions. Do you agree, Dr. Cresswell? Do you want to commit suicide like Totenkopf? Is that why you're asking? No, I think not. Better they should execute me, burn me to atoms with the Einstein bomb. You believe you will be executed? I believe so. But you believe yourself to be innocent. But the world is not just. How were you captured? I do not remember. You were in Berlin at the end of the war, weren't you? I believe so. But as I say, I do not remember. You were captured by the American 69th Infantry Division during the Battle of Berlin. They found you wandering through the rubble, naked and covered in ashes and blood. The blood was not yours, and it was never identified where it came from. They said that you were singing songs and surrendered peacefully. They also reported that you were wearing lipstick. If you say so. They said you seemed to be intoxicated. Hmm. Can you become intoxicated? I can. How much did you drink in the last days? I was not drunk. How do you know that? I thought you couldn't remember. I cannot. But I was not drunk. Can you explain your behavior? Not sufficiently. They were strange days. How so? Are you a Freudian doctor? No, I... am Are you a Jew? What if I was? We should have built a wall. What does that mean? Are you Jewish or not? No, I'm not. We should have just built a wall around us instead of the war. A wall a mile high. And bright green. Do you think that I am insane? No. Do you recall any of your capture? No. But if the reports reflect this, it is probably correct. What will your defense be? What defense? Your defense in court, your argument. I do not know this. You can ask it of my attorney if you want, but I have no defense. Nothing I did needs to be defended. 
I was a soldier of Germany and I did my duty as I was ordered to do it. What crime is this? Do you regret any of your actions? I regret that we did not win. We should have won. We had such spirit and were made of fire. You saw this. It was not to be denied. It would have been good if we had won. We would have made it good. Even for you, Doctor. It should have been a better war. And the last one. Do you believe this was the war to end all wars? No, not since we lost. There will be one other war. Why only one? Between Einstein and I, mankind will not last another war. Only parahumans will be left. He will not be so kind to you, I think. Your children will be incinerated in that war, Doctor. Unless they have the fortune to breed with mine. Would you like that? What do you think will be the result of the trial? I will be exonerated or I will not. I will be absolved or I will not. I will be destroyed, I think. I... Yes, I think I will be destroyed. I do not know how. It will be a travesty, however, as I believe a thorough study of my physiology and ancestry might vastly benefit mankind. Do you want to benefit mankind? Of course I do. And I will. You will see to that, won't you, doctor? Kill me by all means, but do not let them destroy my body. Will you do that? I really have no power in that. Would you not like to examine the corpse? Would not you like a cross-section of my brain, a paper-thin slice under glass? Imagine it. What greatness. You would have to open me up, as x-rays do not work on me. I think you would need a diamond tooth saw to do it, or a beam of intense heat. My flesh is very hard. Examine the liver and the heart. What a boon they could be to humanity. They would be perfection. You would have the heart of the master race in a lead-lined jar forever. I do not think I would decompose. Do you have anything else to add? I am a nationalist. I am a patriot. And Heil Hitler. Thank you, Uberman. Thank you, Herr Doctor. Author's Note. This story was inspired by a book called The Nuremberg Interviews by Leon Goldenschoen, a book of interviews with Nazi Party members, including Goering, awaiting their war crimes trials. It's a deeply disturbing book and one which I will never read again. Superhero mythology was born in the weirdly clear-cut good versus evil morality of World War II, the only moment in history which contained all the elements of a sci-fi potboiler, Mad scientists, rockets, unimaginable cruelty, square-jawed heroes, self-sacrifice, villains who actually wore black uniforms with skulls, world domination, and planet-ending doom weapons. Like superheroism, its symbolism didn't even try to be subtle, and if World War II had been fictional, it would leave any given reader muttering, well, that's a bit much. By the way, a historical note, both the atomic bombs had been dropped on Japan more than six months before the setting of this story, but Uberman is unaware of this because he has been encased in that metal shell thingy since the end of the war in Europe, so that's the reason for that. Thanks very much. Okay, welcome back. Thanks for listening to that story. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for sending us that story, John Madai. It was fabuloso. Did you ever see there was this news article about this <laughs> this cleanser product called Fabuloso, right? And people kept thinking that this cleanser was some kind of fruit drink. Yeah, it was like a, they thought it was a sports drink. They thought it was a sports drink, and they, they would, would drink, drink it. it. But it was like toilet bowl cleaner yeah. or something like that. And, and I guess it was because it was called Fabuloso, they assumed, ooh, well, that's got to mean delicious in Mexican. <laughs> But they interviewed all these people who were dead from chugging that. And it's like, oh, I drank three gallons and a half before I realized it wasn't a fruit drink. I just thought, how oh, stupid are they? Although maybe if after drinking a whole bowl of Fabuloso, you don't, your taste buds don't register that it. Maybe. I've never tried it. Have you ever tried this drink here, though? No. What, what is it? Fabuloso. <laughs> <laughs> no! Oh, it's actually good. Oh. Uh, if you have a story you'd like to submit to us, well, how, how would you do that? 
You would just put it in the body of an email and send it out to submissions at doonsteve.com. Just that simple, huh? It's that simple. Rush on down. <laughs> Operators are standing by. They are. I'm oh, sorry, it's very late. <laughs> and uh, I just drank a quarter of a gallon of Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, you know, it was wild cherry pavolo. So, oh, so that's good. It, all right. <laughs> and also, if you have a comment, a suggestion, a critique, another word that goes in this sentence, how could you send that to us? You could leave a comment on the blog, or you could just send us an email at editor at dunesteve dot com, and we'd read that and check it out and enjoy it. And there is one other thing that we kind of need to do. Not exactly my favorite thing to do. Listening to that robot prattle on over there in the corner is my least favorite. But my second least favorite is to beg for donations. Okay, well, go for it. So I thought you would jump in and say, oh, I'll beg for donations. You sounded like you were going somewhere with it. Then, yeah, you were misled. Hmm. But we do pay our authors. We pay them with real money. Real devalued American currency. <laughs> so we've got a PayPal donation button right there on the website. Press the button. That's right. Can you imagine how good it would feel to be able to say those five words? Yeah. Oh, that's I think only it's four only words. four. Yeah. And, and you can't know how it feels to say those four words unless you donate. That's right. You must actually do that. <laughs> oh, man. I need to pee. Can you edit this part out, OIDOT? Do you really need to be? I do. And go. Because uh, we actually have a, uh, a promo that we're going to play today. Oh, okay. So. Well, I'll run off while you play that. Take it away, announcer man. We'll be right back after these messages. Hi, I'm Norm Sherman, host of the Drabblecast, the weekly flash fiction podcast magazine that brings strange stories by strange authors to strange listeners. We do sci-fi, fantasy, horror, We do funny, strange, and gross. We bring you the best of the weird. The short stories that your favorite authors were too embarrassed to send to anyone else. I mean, where else are you going to hear things like this? Christ, Terry. What the hell is that thing? I don't know. But it ain't no speckled perch. I can tell you that much. Oct moved his eight legs aside. A body lay on the sea floor and not even the drugs in Jell's system could make it look alive. We didn't say nothing about murder. It was a prank, a little kidnapping, not dolphin aside. (laughs) Emperor Mertzatz clenched his fists. His mighty voice bellowed throughout the stone corridors of his palace. I'll get that panda! The Drabblecast. Short, fun, different. Check us out at drabblecast.org. Okay, so we encourage anyone who doesn't already listen to the Drabblecast to head on over there and check it out. Good stuff over there. Dude, I really like the Drabblecast. Me too. It's good stuff. I love the Drabblecast. I don't know that I would necessarily marry the Drabblecast. (laughs) <laughs> but like a lengthy affair. Oh. I, I, I would not rule that out. Rish and Drabblecast sitting in a tree. Sick son of a bitch. Okay. We just had Halloween come and go. That's right. Very sad to see it go. But uh, it'll be back. Stronger and more powerful than ever. <laughs> but uh, my buddy and I got together and we watched some horror movies and... We watched Friday the 13th, the final chapter, which is the fourth one. <laughs> yes, there are seven more after that. There are 11, Friday the 13th. And now 12. Oh, my God. And now Lord, they're remaking there are, it. There are eight more after the final chapter. <laughs> but, uh, you know, halfway through it, I was watching Jason just lumber around, and, and I realized this guy has absolutely no personality. What I, I know people love Jason and for nostalgia's sake or for whatever reason it is, but he, there was nothing to recommend him. He was just this big, silent, mindless stunt man. And so I started thinking about villains, movie villains, and, and the villains that really last and that you really remember fondly. And I thought uh, maybe that should be our subject for this week. Okay. I am down with that. You want to talk about villains? 
uh, were you a fan of like the, any of those slasher series with several sequels and you know centered not, around a not really it's really i mean it's really hard to stick with any of those series some of the first chapters of those series is, is are not so bad though oh okay if you had to nail it down to one slasher icon who do you like i don't know freddy has a lot of personality he's pretty cool personality goes a long way maybe chucky <laughs> It's weird. I like Chucky. Um, I'm not sure that any of those movies except Bride of Chucky are any good, but I like Chucky. And, yeah, I like Michael Myers, and I'm not sure if there's any personality there. It could be argued one way or another, but... uh... (laughs) Which one do you like, O8RT? Oh, the robot in Chopping Mall. That's what he wants. Right. So if we're talking villains today, I, I guess we could talk about some of our favorite villains of all time. I'm going to save my very best villain for last, and uh, we'll start a little further up on the list, like at what would be make be, be my number five. And I, I, this is going all the way back to when I was a little kid. But to me, there was just nobody better than the villains from the cartoons when I was a kid. Like, I've got Megatron on here, and I put Megatron slash Cobra Commander, although Cobra Commander was a little weak, and Megatron was definitely much stronger and much more imposing. And obviously they had him watered down because he was a kid's cartoon villain, not the the R-rated movie villain that can carry through all these threats and just blast everybody. I think in the comic books, they actually killed people. Yeah, they like, did do that. And, and, and in, the, in the movie, he was, oh, yeah, he was right. as vicious and awful as that, too. Uh, you know, the Autobots like, oh, no, you can't do that. And he just goes, Phew pitiful and oh, blasts him yeah. right in the head without even looking which robot was that that he uh, did that to i want to say it was ironhide nice i really like the villains who are just plain evil and they're just you know they don't care about anything but what they're trying to do and it just makes them so much more vicious and and scary that way i've heard a lot of people talking about uh jumping the shark and going to what shows have jumped the shark in what way and i and uh, a lot of people have said that Battlestar Galactica jumped the shark when they took those just completely scary and uncomprehensible Cylons and suddenly started giving them backstories and turning them into good guys and making them as, as important to the uh, story as all of our heroes on the Battlestar Galactica, even though these same Cylons wiped out the entire human race in a planned offensive in the first miniseries, somehow we're supposed to now identify with these people. Well, and there's all sorts of infighting with the the different numbers in the the Cylon crew. And I think that when they first were introduced, the fact that they were cold and calculating machines, but they didn't look like it, were the main way that they defeated us. Yeah, it made them much more scary. And then they turned them into characters and made them all nice. And Therefore, that's why I like Megatron. He's not one of those people that, that's that way. He just he blasts, and he wants nothing but things for himself. He's awful, evil, vicious, and selfish. What, what, what villains do you have to talk about today? Well, you know, I didn't put Megatron, although I could have. I, I love Megatron. Yeah. And I loved Soundwave mm-hmm, yeah. and... Uh, basically, on those cartoon series when we were kids, I always rooted for the bad guys. I thought that the bad guys <laughs> were much more interesting, and of course, their costumes were better. Like the Cobra outfits, yeah, and they're so Storm much Shadow, cooler. and those those guys were so great. And the Crimson Guard, and and all the twins, where one of them felt <laughs> the other one's pain. They uh, were always so much more interesting for some reason. The bad guys, the toys were cooler because they looked cooler. They had cool helmets, and and the good guys were always just so lame. Although. I don't know that they were, you have they to were say lame. It was just Optimus Prime kicked butt. One shall stand, one shall fall. Yeah, yeah, Optimus Prime is cool. I guess it's because the villains are proactive and the heroes are just standing around and waiting for the villains to do something. Oh, I, you know, I liked Skeletor <laughs> way more than He-Man. Yeah. Gargamel way more than all of those friggin' Smurfs. <laughs> Uh, just what about uh, Azrael? Did you like him as much? <laughs> no, not, not quite so much. Now, when we were doing this list, you told me, make sure that you put something literary in there because this is a oh. fiction podcast, right? So I had to think, and I, of all books, the villain 
that I I guess I had to put on my list was Randall Flagg, who's oh, okay. the walking dude. The, the walking villain dude. from The Stand. I actually King. considered that myself. And he's really interesting in that he shows up in a bunch of other King stories or books. or And, right. and you know, it's something that King was doing when he was young, when he was in, in college and stuff. Just the idea that maybe there was this force for evil that came back again and again. Mm-hmm. And it had a different name sometimes and all that. Although it was always RF, right. which is just so cool. Yeah, Randall Flagg is kind of, he's the bringer of the apocalypse in the stand. And I don't know if he had anything to do with the superflu getting out, but once it hits, so does he. And he just walks in there and starts gathering followers. And uh, yeah, it's really, really cool. And they, they made a miniseries in like 93, 94. Uh-huh. I and remember that. that wasn't the Randall Flagg that I had in my <laughs> mind when I saw it. But I guess when you make a movie, that version sort of supplants the vision that you had in your head. That does happen. Speaking about that, um, one of my other villains that I was going to talk about, the author who wrote the books that this villain originally came from refused to watch the movies of his books because he didn't want the movies to taint his vision of the character. You said taint. That's actually Hannibal Lecter from the Thomas Harris novels. You know, he refused to watch those films to, and see uh, Anthony Hopkins playing Hannibal Lecter because he didn't want to have a different Hannibal Lecter than he originally imagined. That's interesting. I've, I've got Hannibal Lecter as my number three. Oh. And I absolutely love Hannibal Lecter. And to me, there's no difference between the one in Thomas Harris's book and the one in Jonathan Demme's film. I've read entire passages along with the movie and it's it's almost word for word a lot of the dialogue and it's just if you ever see the deleted scenes there's like 40 minutes of deleted scenes and it's all from the book huh. uh, he didn't need to not see the movie because it was tremendously faithful and i've heard that he's a bit of a nut and kind of reclusive and he hasn't written a heck of a lot of books and i think four of them are about hannibal Lecter. yeah and the weird thing is too he's a villain but he's never really the villain that's true in the stories there's always you know the red dragon guy or there's buffalo bill etc does he ever does he become the villain really in hannibal no i'd say that half of the book of hannibal is him it's trying a, to evade yeah. the the italian authorities and it, and we're rooting for him yeah it's away. almost like he becomes a hero and at the end he oh without a doubt yeah, wins and etc but uh, it was a terrible story anyway so oh you didn't like it not really no did but, you by um, any chance read the next one the hannibal rising I didn't. Which I think I think I was done was, with it by then. It that one started out as a screenplay, right? Thomas Harris was writing an original prequel about Lecter's life and then the movie didn't get made, so he fleshed it out into a book and, and then, then the, the movie, movie did, did get, get made. made. <laughs> and neither of us saw it. One of our film professors in uh, college once was he showed us a scene from uh, Silence of the Lambs and, and he, he was talked. promptly fired <laughs> and it was the scene when Hannibal Lecter is escaping from that the cage. cage that they've put in the inside the room and he's got the guards around him he pulls this whole thing off he's just butchering these poor guards he cuts the guy's face off and puts it on himself but uh, as he does this whole thing you get to hear Glenn Gould playing the Goldberg variations on the piano coming out of the little radio that he has there. Uh, and, and my professor was, was talking about the interesting juxtaposition of these two ideas where you have Glenn Gould, who is very widely considered to be one of the best piano players of all time, playing this masterpiece written by Johann Sebastian Bach, who was widely considered to be the you know the greatest of all Baroque composers. And, and then you the have the lead singer of Skid Row, right? Johann Sebastian Bach, not just Sebastian Bach. And then you also have Hannibal Lecter there, who is a master at slaughtering human beings, and they're all working together. So Hannibal Lecter hits number four on my list. You got him as three. What do you got as four? Yeah, my number four was the Green Goblin. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And you know what? It should be higher. He should be higher. I absolutely love the Green Goblin as Uh created by Stan Lee. Way back in The Amazing Spider-Man. Not the Power Ranger one? But, oh gosh, just I, I so dislike the Power Ranger costume in the movie. And the fact that he gets stabbed in the nuts <laughs> just bothers me. And I just, I've, I've talked to so many people who are Spider-Man fans. 
maybe fans of only the movie and not the comics or not the cartoons and say, okay, he was killed by, was it Jerry Conway, whoever killed him? He was killed in Amazing Spider-Man 122 in the chest. <laughs> but in the movie, he's killed in the nuts. Is, is that better? There's no definitive answer. Once. Yeah, I'm sorry. I can never stop complaining about the nuts <laughs> thing. And you know, Willem Dafoe was really an interesting actor if they had had a decent costume, if they had even yeah. tried to make it look like the comic book that I redlined it. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to edit that one down. I don't care. I don't know. Stan Lee really reinvented the whole superhero genre and the idea of what a superhero could be. And, and along with that, he reinvented or reimagined how a, a supervillain could be. And the Green Goblin was the father of Peter Parker's best friend. And nowadays, they interpret him as just being an evil, sadistic bastard. But in those days, when Stan was still writing the book up until you know the early 70s, he had the character be a little more rounded. And, and Norman Osborn, the, the goblin, was a very driven, uncompromising man, but he loved his son. And to a certain extent, he loved Peter Parker. And, and they, that was something that they did really well, I felt, in the film, that you know he looked to Peter Parker as like everything that his son was not. But yeah, the Green Goblin was the first villain to figure out who Spider-Man's secret identity was back in uh, right. Amazing Spider-Man 38 and 39. <laughs> and suddenly he was brought to this much higher level. Now, granted, maybe he was a silly looking guy with a green mask and purple costume. But the fact that he could hurt Spider-Man in a way that nobody else could made this guy the most formidable. And he could conceivably go after the people that Peter loves. Yeah. And ultimately... He does, and he kills the the woman that Peter loves. And that was also something that had, up to that point, not been done. Because back in those days, you couldn't kill the supervillains. So they'd have to come up with a clever way to defeat the Green Goblin. And so uh, he would have amnesia, he would lose his memory, kind of like they did in Spider-Man 3 with Harry, uh, and he would forget that he had ever been the Green Goblin and all that, and you would see him return to the Norman Osborn he was before, and then eventually the specter of the Goblin would come back in whatever clever way that Stan figured out how to do it. Mm -hmm. But I, I always felt like, and I know that you feel the same way, that one of the major flaws of practically all of the modern superhero films that aren't Superman are killing the villain at the end of each movie. Right. And the Green Goblin definitely could have lasted for three or four movies and continued and gotten more and more powerful and stronger. And just the fact that you can introduce the hero and the villain and have the villain figure out the hero's identity and have their final confrontation and kill the villain in the same movie, I guess you can do it and it made a zillion dollars, but right. it really always felt like they could have done a lot more. I guess they kind of tried to in Spider-Man 3 by bringing in New Goblin to uh, take the place of the Green Goblin. I guess they just didn't want to bring out that Power Ranger suit again. <laughs> I don't even have words for how much I hate that costume. <laughs> it looks so, so dumb. And maybe a more comics faithful costume would have looked dumb too. But I don't think so. I think you put a fright mask on somebody, they're going to be scary. Yeah, that does. It, you know, it doesn't does have to blink really and it doesn't well. have to talk. But a rubber mask yeah. is way scarier than a. Like the, the one whatever that they that used was. in Scream. Holy crap, was that scary. I don't know. Maybe they'll reboot the Spider Man movies 20 years from now. Well, eventually from they now. will, yeah. I think that there's a lot of room for improvement in a cinematic version of The Goblin. Well, hitting number three on my list, um, I was trying to think of you know something that I really, really enjoy uh, are the villains that are just completely driven. They have one idea in their mind, and they will stop at nothing until they achieve that. And I was thinking the best example of a villain like that, I think, would have to be the Terminator. Oh, without a doubt. He's... That's what he does. That's right. all he does. That's right. He's just a killing machine. He's got the one thing in his mind, and he doesn't stop until he gets And he resorts to some of the, you know, holy crap, evil. He just gets the page out of the dang phone book and goes down the list of Sarah Connors killing them all until he finally gets to the one that, you know, is the heroine of our film. And he doesn't stop, and he doesn't stop, and he keeps coming. It's a, you know, that's a really interesting uh, take on a villain. And, you know, he's not emotional about it. He's not uh, driven by hate. He just has a mission that he has to achieve, and he's going to do everything that must be done until it's done. Sarah Connor. 
when he doesn't stop even after the skin is completely melted off of him. He keeps coming. He's still crawling. He's just the robot framework. I love the fact that they he blow off coming. his legs and he crawls. Yeah. Even in Terminator 2, we have a new Terminator, the T-1000, who is coming out. And it's basically the same thing. And it's hard to say which one is scarier. Something just so freaking scary about Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was a young man like he was in the Terminator film. And just that complete lack of, you know, smile, any facial uh, expression or anything that he gives us in that film. But the T-1000 has so many amazing abilities, how it can just flow. And, you know, it seems almost as unstoppable as, you know, trying to stop a river with your hand or something you know it's just gonna flow around there and then drown you but i think i still prefer the uh, arnold schwarzenegger version of the terminator in early concept of t2 cameron was going to have a t800 versus a t800 and it was going to be a good schwarzenegger and a bad schwarzenegger fighting each other and i don't know if it was money wise they decided not to go that way but that would have been really interesting I think probably the way they went was much, much better. Yeah. And I like that they cast a small guy or, you know, just a, a very a svelte huh. uh, Robert Patrick for that it's because it looks like in a, real, in a real world fight, yeah, this guy wouldn't stand a chance. And part of that is like his camouflage, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. The Arnold Schwarzenegger T-800 stands out in a crowd. Right. And the fact that this guy is this big lumbering, you know there's something wrong with this guy. And I <laughs> love that. But this chameleon that is the T-1000, it's much a, a much better infiltration unit because it could right. be you. What do you think of the uh, TV show where they use the small form of River Tam as the uh, trying to stop a river with your hand? <laughs> uh, I, dude, I absolutely love that show. It's weird. I I never would have guessed because I hate Terminator Three. Uh-huh. And in the past few years, it seems like the esteem for Terminator Three has just gone up and up and up. And people really? talk about how good the ending is and all that. I hate that movie, and I hate how it undermined everything that James Cameron did. But I feel like this, the Sarah Connor Chronicles holds up James Cameron's world and his words and is so faithful to it and tries to be an extension to that to the characters rather than just let's rehash Terminator 2 every week, which is what Terminator 3 was. Yeah, there was an episode where Cameron, the girl Terminator, <laughs> uh, she is damaged and she reverts to her original programming and you get to see her as a Terminator again trying to kill John and Sarah and... I was like, wow, that's really weird because she's even less intimidating physically than right. Robert Patrick is. But there's something about just that dead expression on her face and the fluid way that she moves as an actress or ballerina or whatever she is. <laughs> that was like, wow, dude. And wow. They've, they started season two and there's a T-1000 on there now too, uh, which I think is really neat. I, I really like the show. I, I like it way more than I ever thought I could. Huh. What do you think? I think I've mentioned this to you before, but I never thought of her as being a hot chick when she was on uh, Firefly, but wow, she's hot. It's so weird. Yeah, I've never been attracted to River Tam, ever. Yet I am attracted to Cameron, the girl Terminator. Strange. Yeah, you just like those robots. Well, (laughs) I like all robots but one. Oh, right. Do you even want to translate that? I never want to translate it. All right, well, let's, let's move on. Ask. Okay, so uh, when we were talking, you said, well, okay, maybe a literary villain, maybe a movie villain, maybe a comic book villain kind of thing. So uh-huh. a number two on my list is Magneto from oh. the X-Men. You mean Magneto. <laughs> Damn your eyes. You'll never let that go, will you? <laughs> you know, I feel like Magneto's portrayal in the three Fox films was a heck of a lot closer to the comic books than... Green Goblin was. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just say one in the same, the Ian McKellen version or the comic book version of Magneto. He's such an interesting villain in that he is, in his mind, he's not a villain. And I guess no bad guy thinks that they're bad. Right. But he came from a very oppressed upbringing where people who were different were persecuted. And then as he became a, an older man, he, he saw that same persecution coming to people that were like him, that were different. So from trying to prevent a second Holocaust from happening, like it happened during the the 40s, he became a supervillain. 
obviously he wasn't like that when he was first created. I mean, he was the leader of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants <laughs> and all that. But as Chris Claremont took over the X-Men franchise and just began to create more and more interesting backstories for these characters, Magneto became somebody that wasn't all bad. And for a long time, he you know, attempted to redeem himself and, and came over onto the good side. And he led the X-Men for a little while, which is just like, yeah. wow, that's, that's amazing. And, he was... In the alternate universe of the uh, Age of Apocalypse, he is the guy who started the X-Men because Charles Xavier is killed before he's able to do so. That's really interesting. We are the future, Charles. Not them. <laughs> I had never really even heard of Ian McKellen uh, until like Gods and Monsters came out, which I guess was just like a year before he was cast in X-Men or cast as Gandalf in that. Uh, he brings some kind of dignity and some kind of intellect and some kind of, I don't know if it's decency or whatever, uh, to the, the part. And the fact that even though they're enemies, there is a friendship in, between right. Xavier and Magneto, and they carry that through the film. And you know what? A lot of people really hate <laughs> X-Men 3. I, I don't hate it. And I love that last scene where Magneto's just this old, pitiful guy playing by himself in the park playing chess by himself in the park <laughs> and uh trying to make that chess piece move with his mind right yeah just... that's good stuff yeah i i considered magneto myself when i was thinking about uh the villains that i really like but in the end i chose to go another way and it's again a comic book villain but he's been played on tv and played in the movies and and everywhere else but i decided to go with the joker wait till they get a load of me you know i think the reason why i like the joker so much yeah, one time I, I rented that film, um, the Justice, Justice League, League New Frontier, and they had this big documentary where they talked all about the villains that are in the uh, Legion of Doom. And uh, when they get to the Joker in there, one of the uh, writers from DC was saying that, you know, the Joker is just such a great villain because you never know what he's going to do. He could shoot you right through the head or he could hand you $1,000 and walk away. He's so completely unstable and so completely unpredictable that I think it makes him ten times more scary. I remember one time watching the Batman animated series and the Joker goes running off and goes down this alley and Batman goes chasing after him and he comes around the corner and there's this giant jack-in-the-box and the handle's rolling around and Batman's like, oh crap. You know, so he grabs the handle and he's fighting and he's fighting to keep this handle from turning around and it's going because it's a mechanism and he's fighting and fighting finally it gets all the way around and a giant jack-in-the-box head pops out and that's all it is <laughs> <laughs> it's just so great that you know the, the, the joker will do that kind of crap you know you'd never know what he's gonna do it could that could have been a friggin' nuclear bomb for all you know what's gonna come out of there but no it's just a jack-in-the-box head this time but next time, who knows? And that, that part in the, the new movie where he said, you'll never kill me because you don't kill or whatever. And I'm never going to kill you because you're just too much fun. <laughs> you know, it's just great stuff. Yeah, I, I just love the Joker. I think he's such a great villain. And he's been played by lots of different people. And I remember back when uh, Jack Nicholson did his portrayal and everybody hailed it as the greatest thing ever. Nobody thought he could be superseded. But I, I absolutely loved Heath Ledger as the Joker. And I don't know how much of it was the script that was written, which was just really, really well done, and how much of it was his portrayal of the character, which was also really, really well done. But uh, not disappointed by <laughs> the Joker the same way that you are by uh, the Green Goblin. It's a shame that he won't be back for the next film. All right, so that brings us to number one, and uh, I've already I cheated, so I looked and saw what your number one was. <laughs> uh, it's pretty obvious, yeah. And we both have the same number one, which yeah. I think is cool. I, I, I'm willing to bet you could poll a hundred guys that are between ten years older than us and all the way down to the age of my son, who is eight, and you're most likely going to get that same number one for everybody. And who is it? The Purple Pie Man in Strawberry Shortcake. He's just amazing. He's like 10 feet taller than all the other strawberry shortcakes, and he wears that big poofy hat. And I think he has a mustache. A yeah, it's, mustache. it's long. I mean, that works on many levels. Yeah, so on my list, I wrote Darth Vader. Dude, I wrote Darth Vader, too. Oh, 
What was that crap about the purple pie man? Uh, oh, wait, OT, will, will you edit that out, please? Yeah, please. So anyways, Darth Vader, number one. What is it about Darth Vader that you like? Three. <laughs> yeah, you know, Darth Vader, holy cow. First of all, he's like seven feet tall or something, which is obviously really imposing. And he's got that all black suit and that that dark that, and evil mask. Did he scare you as much uh, as he scared me? Dude, a way to T can only edit out so many things. Right, well, he's earning his paycheck this week. <laughs> yeah, so, the costume the, and the mask. Yeah, the, it just sucks in the light. You know what I mean? And just everything around it looks darker because he's there he's just so scary that big cape and everything yeah yesterday i was having a conversation with somebody and he was talking about how lame it was that one of the superheroes i like wears a cape and it's just like how you know impractical a cape is and how that you just can't make that imposing and it's so passe and that but think about that cape on darth vader and even when he's lightsaber fighting or whatever you never see that cape get in the way I and mean, it just looks so cool. Yeah. What flowing behind him and when he, like he's walking through the tunnels in Hoth and it's flowing right. behind. It flaps very little, but it makes him look even bigger. On top of that, the breathing thing. It's just gosh, something so amazingly sinister about that. It's just always sitting there going <sighs> Doesn't matter if he's saying anything at all, just him being there scares you now because he's got that noise going on all the time that's a well put together villain on so many levels also the james earl jones voice the way the way he talks in empire strikes back you do not yet realize your importance <laughs> you know all that stuff yeah, he's really well written too the way that he speaks like his his cadence or his just the the rhythm to the way he speaks and the certain words that he you know don't be too proud of this technological terror you've constructed you know, one of those things where it just it probably would sound silly spoken by someone else, but it's just in this big stately voice, yeah. like Gandalf speaking or something like that. Right. With our combined strength, we can end this destructive conflict. <laughs> you know, I talked a lot about various things that I like about villains and the villains that are just so crazy and sadistic and driven and will accomplish that one goal no matter what. And Darth Vader's kind of a combination of all of those things. He's trying to catch that friggin' Millennium Falcon and every stupid deckhand or whoever that screws up, you know, will wind up dead on the deck for having done so. You know, he just keeps choking them. God, he's just so evil. But what about that moment at the end of Empire Strikes Back where they've disabled the hyperdrive? And, you know, like Admiral Piet says, oh, you know, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's deactivated, sir kind of thing and then r2 gets it going and it goes into hyperdrive and vader does that double take the window <laughs> and you see piet and he's just like oh no i am so <laughs> dead and vader just turns and walks away uh -huh. I, i'd like to credit lawrence kasdan for that I, I i don't know but just the the fact that he doesn't kill piet that he doesn't kill anyone he, or, or rant or rave or scream or tear the walls down he just walks away yeah, on top of that, there's that John Williams theme. I mean, it's called the Imperial March, but it's basically Darth Vader's theme. And it's so imposing to the point where college football bands will play that song every time their defense makes a good play. And it's not just some podunk dorky college. Every dang college in the country does that. There were so many pieces that had to fall in place to make Darth Vader the greatest villain of all time, in my estimation. Yeah, I, I don't know what uh, else you could put in that place. Megalon. Yeah, he was. Wow. I, I can't see into the future, but I predict that Vader will be around when you and I are gone. That he'll be like the Wicked Witch of the West from <laughs> 1939. Or he'll be like Count Dracula from oh. 1897 and still be around a hundred years from now and kids will know who he is. I, I think that much great work went into Darth Vader and he's that much a part, not even of American culture, but of global culture. Yeah. And I think that the moon colonies have a <sighs> Darth Vader. Impressive. Most impressive. So there's our take on villains. Thanks for listening, and uh, as usual, I'm Big Anklevich. 
And I'm Rish Outfield. Reminding you that life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says otherwise is selling something. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Wait, oh, you weren't talking to me. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. With frequency, or with frequency, with <laughs> spikency, <laughs> with frequency, what the hell? <laughs>